Welcome to today's Department of the Air Force Ask Me Anything session. Uh, we have the privilege and honor of hearing uh, today from Dr. Will Roper, who oversees over $60 billion of acquisition and technology programs in the Space Force and Air Force, but probably more importantly for today than the job title is the fact that he's been a constant driver of innovation and change across the entire Department of Defense. Uh, I'm Preston Dunlap, the Chief Architect of the Department of the Air Force, working for Dr. Roper with the task of ensuring that we not only uh, build by and produce the right set of capabilities, that we do so rapidly uh, and as an ecosystem or family of capabilities. Which brings us to the today's topic of conversation, which is the top modernization priority for the Space Force and the Air Force, uh, which is the digital modernization of the department, uh, known as the Advanced Battle Management System or ABMS. Uh, today, first, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Roper with some opening remarks, and then we're going to spend the, the vast majority then of the time uh, uh, asking and answering questions uh, of Dr. Roper from you. Uh, so as he speaks, that would be a good time to type those questions into YouTube, uh, and I'll be filtering through those. I'm confident, uh, given the number of folks participating and the time that we have, that I won't be able to address all of them, uh, although I'll make every attempt to be able to cover uh, those questions in the time that we have allotted. Uh, so with no further ado, then let me introduce Dr. Roper. Thanks, Preston. And just let me say publicly, it's just wonderful that you were willing to come back into government to, to lead many initiatives, but particularly this program, because it is a horse of a different color. And every day that we go through advanced battle management system, we take a step closer to the digital modernization that the department has known it's needed to undertake, but has never actually been forced to do because we could follow traditional Cold War processes and win. And so if you're not aware of the history of this program, it started with then the Air Force trying to find a way to replace the J-STARS airplane that does command and control and battle management and air and on the ground, very important in an uncontested fight but against uh, a capable adversary in a contested conflict, we simply couldn't find a way to protect an airplane that big that an adversary knows is that valuable. And that rabbit hole led us down something much bigger than just an airplane replacement program. It crossed the boundaries of air, space, and sea because for the first time, the Department of the Air Force had to break up something it would normally have done as one single integrated system. And so here we are months later, so far forward of just thinking of airplanes that we are now thinking of the advanced battle management system as the internet of things dot mil. And for those of you that have been following the hype and the talk about AI and machine learning and the department talking about the future of warfare and machine machine data exchanges. And in the back of your mind, you thought, but very little of that has happened. It's because we have not built that foundational internet to allow those exchanges. And now this program that's forefront and center and, and a services sight line is going to force us to do that. So it's in a very exciting time to bring in technology that we know works because we leave this building, you can see the emblem behind us, and we go into our personal lives that are massively connected and are enabled by analytics and machine learning that provides critical information for things like aiding retirement planning down to the silly and trivial, like what's the next cat video you should watch? Well, why should our service men and women leave lives where they are connected to everything and come into a military where they're connected to almost nothing? So we're excited to make this program about the connective tissue that's never in the limelight, but that will be the delineator as, as whether we win or lose in a digitally enabled war. It is hard to articulate because we have to go into things like cloud and platform and data management and analytics, software defined systems, software defined radios and networks. But we've got to get good at this. We've got to get comfortable at this. And it's got to be as important to us as the planes and ships and ground vehicles that are so much easier to sell on the hill and in this building because we can take pictures of them. So I'm excited to take your questions today, hopefully to spread a little bit of hype about the upcoming on-ramp where we're going to try to do some firsts again for the department. And I'll just simply end by asking the AFWORKS team, just throw up the, uh, the graphic of the advanced battle management system as we envision it 
today, just for 10 or so seconds. Now, as you look at this, now the planes and ships and things may be unusual, but the cloud, the connectivity, the analytics, that's stuff that we have in our personal lives. So the hope that I have is that we don't have to recreate them, but we have to manifest them in an image that our warfighters can use and that makes sense with the force structure we have today. So I don't undersell the challenge of this, but I'm looking forward to the opportunity of taking another evolution in another couple of weeks for on-ramp two, and hopefully uh, asking you, whether you're from industry or the government or just someone that's wondering what is the department doing with this internet stuff, uh, to enlist you to help us think through how a digital force will fight in the future. Because this is the program that's gonna blaze that trail. Preston? Want to do some questions? Yeah, that's great. So uh, I've already got some coming in. Uh, reminder, do uh, do enter those questions into the website, and uh, we'll be tracking those and integrating them as we talk. I think the first one is a good one. It actually uh, sort of dovetails with some of your, your last comments there, which is uh, when you talk about it, it, uh, it seems pretty straightforward in the personal life, but we all know that the Department of Defense is nothing like our personal life. <laughs> so how, how do you uh, bring the two together? <laughs> uh, boy, wait, there are so many jokes to tell. I probably should be careful. Um, you're exactly right. We, we've undervalued digital technology and digital transformation because it's hard to sell. There, there's going to have to be a major culture shift and the fact that there's a program this big in the Air Force and Space Force and that it's a top priority for our secretary in chief tells you that we've got the makings of a culture shift. But now we, we've got to truly put our money where our mouth is. And it ultimately boils down to money. If we fund this and make it a priority, we can do it. But there are many different forces that are at play in our budget. This building, Congress, stakeholders in the operational command and commands around the world. And we've got to make it really clear why this is important to win in future and why the platforms that we have today are all going to operate at a completely different level. Um, many of you may have heard of the components of ABMS, and we're working on the internet side of ABMS, the cloud one, platform one, data one. That's kind of the tech stack that builds the internet. But this is an internet of things, of military things. And ultimately, we're going to be talking about fighters and ships and ground vehicles and how to make them smart things, which will require some changes to them, but changes that are going to make them completely awesome on the future battlefield. I think once we get one of the first platforms and we call it a smart system and an internet of things construct, then it'll start becoming tangible because you'll be able to do the before and after. How did a smart how did a smart eagle work? How does it work compared to a non-smart eagle or whatever, whatever their politically correct term is for not being a smart thing? Uh, we'll get there, but we've got to get concrete and we've got to do it in a hurry. Uh, great. Uh, next questions. Uh, next question is, uh, can you explain more? You mentioned uh, talking about on-ramps. Uh, can you give context for what an on-ramp is? Sure. It's our AFWORKS team, if you can just kind of float up uh, the the chart for the on-ramp, maybe just five or, or six seconds or so. So this on-ramp is massive. I mentioned um, uh, uh, up front, we're excited about this on-ramp, but there are going to be 70 different industry teams that are participating, 65 different government teams, 33 different platforms, uh, two different combatant commanders, but all of it acting as one joint team. And what's the point? Why do we do these four month cycles where the idea is to get a lot of different things together to bring out new technologies like cloud and platform and software defined radios and see what we're able to successfully connect and not. And it's precisely to force the type of rapid learning so that we can move and build and operate at internet speeds. So the point of the on ramp is to hopefully get some things right but to also hopefully not get some things right. It is to provide just as much useful feedback to engineers who need to correct systems before errors or risk or whatever it is they overlook before it grows. We're trying to kill that old big traditional acquisition death trap of going years and years before you learn anything in the real world about your system. The four month cycles will get that out of the way. The other reason is to get some fluency in our operators about how cloud and platform and data analytics, how to use those on the battlefield, right? There's no, there's no con ops for this. There's no playbook for this. 
And we need to start writing one at internet speeds as well. And so this is just as much about our operators getting their hands dirty with combat cloud and thinking about what do you want to be able to virtualize and who do you want to be able to access that? And how does that play on a battlefield where you may not have that access because your enemy's disconnecting you from it? Well, we've got to work through that. These on-ramps are a chance to do that as well, which is why Spacecom and Northcom are driving the next one. We're going to be supporting Spacecom, you know, dealing with warfare as it could happen in space and letting them think through how the digital side of warfare can help them win and working with Northcom on Homeland Defense, just like we did at the last on-ramp. So the two groups, the operators and the engineers should both leave that feeling that they check some boxes and they've got some things to work on. Yeah, just as I was listening to you, it, it makes, I think, a lot of sense, but uh, it might be helpful to give a little bit of context, if you don't mind, on is that the normal way of business that we do things, and, and how, what's the normal approach versus this, to, to, sh to color that a bit? Well, just in, as context, nothing we do in the Department of Defense is normal. If you look <laughs> at the rest of the world, most of our processes are Cold War era. They're slow, they're lethargic, and they're losing we are losing based on the pace at which we can build new things. We had an awesome military, we would win today, but we won't win if we keep working at a Cold War pace. So this four month rapid cycle is like nothing else in the Department of the Air Force or Department of Defense. Doing demonstrations or fielding capability every year, uh, that was unprecedented until we started bringing in agile software development practices. So. If you've heard of organizations like Kessel Run or Kobayashi Maru or Level Up or Space Camp, or I could go on and on, we have 60 or more of these organizations that push operational capability in digital form to operators every week. Days matter in software now for the Department of the Air Force, for the Air Force and Space Force. What ABMS is doing is just simply bringing that lean DevOps methodology to hardware as well. And there's no, there's no rocket science involved with this. We just have to be okay with pushing capabilities out in smaller slices that stack up to larger ones. The, the benefit from us is de-risking. We learn more and we learn more often. The detriment is that those learning opportunities can be held up as a reason why you won't succeed. And so we've gotta be really good at explaining why Having a 50-50 pass-fail ratio is the right place for us to balance so that we're learning, uh, but we're also uh, nailing some things down as well. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a lot of terms out there, uh, advanced battle management system, join all domain, command control, multi-domain operations, and the list goes on. Uh, can, can you uh, or sort of explain that ecosystem of the efforts across, uh, across the department? Sure, it, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate alphabet soup. It's kind of like Castle Anthrax from Monty Python. It's not a very good name, is it? Um, but it's the castle we have nonetheless, so we've got to play it forward. If you want to guess from me, I think we'll eventually rename Advanced Battle Management System because it really isn't that anymore. It started as the recap of JSTARS. It started as airborne battle management. It expanded into advanced battle management when we realized we would probably have to have air and space and maybe ground components to replace that mission. But then we realized if you actually wanna be able to distribute something and have those distributed uh, platforms be able to work together seamlessly, you've signed yourself up to build an internet of things. You're going to need things like radio, software-defined systems. You're going to need cloud. You're going to need containerized software so you can move it from your cloud to the edge seamlessly. So we signed ourselves up to build the internet. And so now, is this really an advanced battle management system, or is it simply a system that's meant to make data produced anywhere discoverable anywhere? And it's really the latter. And we can't do it alone. And we've been working as, as hard as we can to transcend the battle management moniker, the command and control moniker, because that means something different to every single service. That's a big thing for the joint force to undertake. And it is bigger than what we're going to do in this program. What we want to do is ensure that machine-to-machine -machine data exchanges occur everywhere. 
that if any sensor sees something, that data is available to a shooter anywhere without impediments, human-driven processes, phone calls, Merck chats. And if we do that, then we can write the book. The joint force can write the book about how joint all domain command and control or how advanced battle management per se happens in future. But this program is simply about building an internet, machine to machine data exchanges and making sure that the lives that we live in our personal lives are at least moderately reflected in the military that goes to war. That, I think that uh, the answer to that question helps sort of set the context for the next, uh, which is, has ABMS actually been identified as the C2 system of choice uh, for DoD for JADC2? Uh, I think the it's a leading candidate, but one thing that I'm fighting hard against is uh, there's not going to be one system in the future force. ABMS for the Department of the Air Force is meant to be able to uh, allow data to data, da you know, machine to machine data exchanges across our two services, the Air Force and Space Force. And where other services have systems that are doing machine to machine data exchanges across their platforms, all we have to do is what the internet does. I mean, who's in charge of the internet? Who's the program manager? Who's the PEO, right? If, if you were to create a program in the Pentagon called the internet, I mean, my goodness, uh, the, the entire woodworks would cry out against you saying there's no way to succeed. And yet this amazing, highly integrated system of system does through just simple adherence to publishable, understood standards and interfaces. And so that's really the direction I think we're going is not one unified system, uh, but, but simply systems where we have an imperative to publish our interfaces, our APIs, our standards, so that we can get data off of them and we can push data onto them. And so if, if we in advanced battle management were to go to the Army, and the Army has some uh, amazing vision for their future, uh, command and control in their future networks. And I've, I've spoken with Chief McConville about this. We are all on board with sharing data at, a, at machine speeds. All we have to do is be able to translate across the two. And so I think that's where we're going, Preston. I don't think we're going to one and only one system, but we're going to a construct where our many systems work as one system, just like the internet does. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I, that leads to the next one, which is uh, how is the Air and Space Force engaging with the with the other services and combatant commanders in ABMS? We are. I think we're trying to demystify what this is. And I, I mentioned a few minutes ago that command and control is different between the services. And when you start with that term, you paint a very different picture. Uh, and I think put services at at understandable uneasiness. But when we start talking about sharing data at machine speeds, no one pushes back on that, that we need to have APIs that are understood, that um, that doing trans, if we can't change systems to be able to share that data directly, that having intermediaries that can act as gateways or translators, very similar to what we did with F-22 and F-35, that that makes sense and we're all on board doing it. So I, I think that's the direction we'll be going is let's just talk about getting data shared across the joint force Let's do all of the easy things first. Uh, let's make sure that foundational infrastructure like cloud and platform and data management, that if we don't agree to do one system that's shared across the joint force, that the multiple systems work together as if they're one system. And, and then, then I think we can take on the harder things. And prediction on that, Preston, is going to be when we have to say in the Air Force, go to an F-22 and replace the computers on board because they're not optimized to do data analytics at the edge. Well, that, that's not going to be a non-trivial cost. But if we've laid all of that extra foundation first, maybe we're more excited to pay for that, because when you come back with that smart Raptor, it plugs into all of that internet enablement. So let's crawl, walk, run on this, or maybe crawl, run, warp, uh, which is the speed <laughs> we need to go. Uh, but, but we do need to be mindful to not make it too hard up front. You know, I think I think you're talking about the the power of making those platforms then sort of better than themselves uh, by the power of integration. 
Uh, the other the other piece I might just extend that to with the combatant commander portion of the question too is that they provide that warfighter operator uh, perspective and are great partners uh, for us to be able to bring in the entire joint force together under the banner of a real uh, forward facing operational set of scenarios that changes over time. And at least from where I sit, that's been a tremendous partnership with each of the combatant commanders, uh, especially as we look forward to the upcoming year. Hey, one thing on that, Preston, a lot of times I hear people in this building say combatant commanders uh, don't worry about the future. They don't think about the future. They're just worried about their current war fight. And we we find completely the opposite. They get the need for this a lot more than this building does. Uh, <laughs> they know that they're not going to be able to keep their plans intact without it. And I'll tell you, General O'Shaughnessy and General Raymond are just real visionaries. General Raymond's not a combatant commander as of very recently, but he was. Uh, now he's our chief of space operations and General Shaughnessy, commander of NORTHCOM. But wow, really future looking visionaries who got this. And I think one of the best days for both of us, Preston, was when General Shaughnessy told the DEPSEC DEF, I would take this nascent ABMS system now over my current C2 system. We had to say, well, wait a second, we got we have some more work to do. <laughs> but um, that tells you that they get it. And so I hope the combatant commanders will put a lot of pressure on this building that this, this isn't a nice to do. This is a must do. This isn't innovation. This is imperative. We will lose if we're still having to make phone calls in a future fight. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the other thing that hit me too when General O'Shaughnessy told that to the Deputy Secretary uh, just was the willingness uh, and the the, the issues that the combatant commanders face on the forward you know, front lines uh, of defending and protecting the nation uh, where, where you know, something is better than nothing uh, and what willingness to accept agility and flexibility is the most important aspect so that they can modernize seamlessly over time, which I think was a big strategic message from the, the combatant commander at that time. And I, I suspect as we, we turn this year to look at uh, and partner with Admiral Davidson and Pacific Command and General Walters and European Command, we're going to see some similar uh, some similar cries from the, the forward uh, troops. Uh, getting back to the, the questions then, so how uh, you mentioned uh, interoperability and standards uh, to be able to then not just sort of have one thing that does everything, but uh, one set of standards or a set of standards that actually is aim enabling things to snap together like Lego blocks. So could, could you uh, share a little bit more about standards that are under consideration and how uh, others uh, out of the Pentagon ought to be thinking about that that want to contribute to the fight? Sure. Um, I mean, so, you know, the, the magic of APIs is a magic that we need to have uh, within the Pentagon, within the joint force. And it's not something that we have current requirements for. Uh, for those of you who understand, we have a formal requirements process that ends up creating uh, numbers that become performance specifications that we put on contract with industry that ultimately lead to systems that meet those specs, that meet those requirements, that therefore do the mission. So you start from the top, you work it down, and then it works all the way back to the top. Um, the things we're talking about are horizontal things, and that's not the way the Pentagon works right now. Things that require a design architecture or, or interfaces, um, programming interfaces that will share data seamlessly or things that will allow for microservice development. So moving into like service mesh, well, that's not the kind of bread and butter of the Pentagon. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is having General Hyten as the vice chairman and had long discussions with him about a new kind of requirements process that he is going to champion. That's going to take on how do we write a requirement for these digital kinds of technologies. And we've got work to do on this, but I think the thinking is very similar to the way the, the internet works. If you don't abide by standards that are already in place, you go out of business because that's where your users are. And right now, we understand standards we need today. They're waveforms, they're message formats that are needed across the joint force, things like Link 16, where we need to get better than that eventually, but we're not going to abandon it today. So you start with that, and then we'll simply add to it. And I think the direction we're going is a set of compliance cases that if you're building a whatever, you have to meet these top 10 things, and then they're a set of desired but not necessarily uh, required standards that have to be met. And the direction I'm giving to our programs is, is if it exists as a commercial standard, go ahead and put it in. So, you know, 5G is going to be one of the cool things that we bring to the battlefield in the next on-ramp. 5G is going to be evolving. China's pushing standards. U.S. industry wants to push back with 
things that we believe are going to be more secure, uh, take them all, is my view. Software definition means you should only be limited by the physics of your aperture. And physics of aperture can really be pushed as well with modern uh, radio designs. So we really need to think outside the box, literally, where the box is where our aperture sits with the computer right behind it. Yeah, uh, on, on the, you referenced General Heighton and the, the requirements uh, process that he's uh, working through and, uh, uh, and a question on nuclear command and control. What's the relation then uh, with nuclear command and control and advanced battle management? Uh, they're like this. So General Heighton, I've mentioned uh, what a strategic thought leader in the department, but we've got another one in General Ray, who's the commander of Global Strike. And uh, it's wonderful having him there because a long time ago, he was our director of weapons programs in Air Force acquisition. So we've got a, an operator that's had a stint in acquisition and he gets it, that we have to do things different for the nuclear mission. And think about what NC3 needs. You need a, a way of communicating that's absolutely certain and assured for the nation's worst possible day. Well, the direction we're going in advanced battle management system and more broadly with the internet of things dot mill is having a whole myriad of ways of being able to connect, of having every possible sen sensor or data source connected to every possible actor, very much the way the internet is. Well, that provides uh, just amazing new thinking about how to do assured communications for NC3. And so the, the great graphic that both US STRATCOM and Global Strike have is the advanced battle management system circle and then the Venn diagram they create is NC3 right next to it, and they're nearly overlapped. So in getting ABMS right, we will be burning down nearly all of the risk for NC3. So that partnership is strong. And whoever asked the question, it's very insightful. Um, and I think the, you know, it's going to be really cool to see what kinds of new technology uh, we bring to bear. Uh, so another another question on that on uh, getting tech uh, out to the warfighter and digital transformation uh, in terms of culture change uh, here in the Air Force and the Space Force. Uh, so the question posits is that to really make that cultural change, you need to listen to that individual warfighter uh, out there. Uh, and so how does uh, AVMS and the Air and Space Force going to handle that transformation and culture change that's required to do everything you just discussed uh, without having to go through layer after layer after layer of supervisors? Uh, well, it's a big, so we've got the supervisor thing and then listening to the warfighter thing and just more generally culture change in general. So yes, there will have to be a culture change. We will have to care more about data on the future battlefield than bullets. But ladies and gentlemen, data is the most precious thing, the most valuable thing on the earth today. And if we can't make that the most valuable thing on the battlefield, we've already lost no matter how good our bullets are. So I view that as a self-evident imperative and that the culture will, will simply have to change to it because it's obvious. Now, those, those middle layers, yes, I, I know that's a challenge in any bureaucracy is how to flatten things. Um, I, I'm not as big of a believer that that's an impediment you can't get over. You just simply have to over message and simply be clear and unambiguous so that your message does not change as it goes through those different layers. But that warfighter at the edge is where I'm most excited and passionate because yes, we should be listening to them. We should be listening to every operator of every system. They are the user. And up until now, we don't really have a lot of options to tailor our response to them. We're retailing, tailoring our responses to all of them. Right? Nothing is very personalized. I can't help you currently be a better user, you a better user. I'm helping all of you. And that all of you actually does that kind of averaging. You know, the kinds of things that, that an operator that's very good at you know, fighting air to air, but maybe doesn't feel quite as confident fighting air to ground, well, boy, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be great to give them specialized capabilities that are tailored towards their needs, just like they would have in their home devices. Well, now we, we have an opportunity to finally, to finally do that with ABMS. So the thing I hope for is when we get to the AI portion, to that smart layer, sitting in the cloud and riding on top of all of the data, we hope we'll be there very soon, is that we don't just have analytics that are there at the macro warfighting level, 
but that we have analytics for individual operators that, that give them data in a way that helps them do their mission better that they can interact with and improve over time. And if we do that, then the cool thing is we actually won't have to necessarily listen to those operators. We'll be designing a system that listens to them for us. Coming soon to a theater near you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that's a great lead in to you know, touching the individual warfighter, the, the ops part of DevOps, uh, if you will, uh, with the upcoming set of uh, on ramps that, that we have. So, uh, a, a question coming back on on ramp number two uh, that will be happening here in the first week in September with uh, General Van Herc, uh, the NORTHCOM commander, and General Dickinson, the SpaceCom commander, the head of the table. Uh, but with individual operators uh, actually running the systems and trying the technology. The, the question is, uh, could you articulate uh, more of what we will expect to see or the challenges that we'd like to overcome uh, as an air and space force as part of uh, on-ramp number two? Sure, there's gonna be, there's gonna be so much happening that uh, no one's gonna be able to keep up with it. And that's exactly why we need uh, digital enablement to help these future warfighters and what's gonna be a very complicated event not nearly as complicated as a future war is going to be. So it's a harbinger of what we need to get ready for. On the space side, a lot of what we're going to be doing is classified, but we're going to be holding space systems in denial and, and very much a representative way that a real world threat could and require space command to continue to operate through uh, those uh, simulated attacks, uh, both to keep space operations clean uh, and green but to also support operations in the other domains of conflict. And then for the Homeland mission, we're gonna be simulating uh, attacks on critical infrastructure and allowing, uh, allowing NORTHCOM uh, to take different kinds of action from using fighters, using ships, to beat down simulated cruise missiles, to a hypervelocity gun weapon system acting as a new kind of point defense at the very end, uh, protecting highly critical assets uh, with a deep magazine. And I think the, the overall challenge is not necessarily those things, Preston. That's the kind of stuff that will be written up in hot washes and senior leader briefings and make for good PowerPoint briefings. But I think the real point of the exercise is there's going to be so much happening at so many different locations concurrently, you can't keep up with it. So how do these two commanders have situational awareness? Well, today, in truth, you can't. You're going to be doing that through hundreds, if not thousands, of people making phone calls and hoping that telephone effect doesn't happen. I played that game as a kid. Preston never went very well. <laughs> uh, and I think it's going to create a clear signal that, yes, I have to simplify uh, what these commanders see. And analytics let me do that. And COVID has been a great been a great trial run for us because all of the work from on-ramp one, we just rolled directly into supporting Northcom with the Homeland COVID response. And boy, for something as critical as responding to this pandemic, taking complicated data, who, you know, uh, number of people infected, number of resources that are available like hospitals and first responders and finding a way to synthesize all of that. So you got a sense of where the hotspots were and the direction they were going. You didn't have time uh, to have the commander sit down and make uh, hundreds of phone calls. It had to be evident. And so uh, we were able to do that for COVID. And now we've got to show we can do that for a contested war fight. And if we get that right, then I think by the time we get to one ramp three, the demand signal is going to be, well, what else can you do? Yeah, I think that, that spoke a powerful message. I appreciate you bringing that up too with um, you know, COVID being, it's not a future capability, right? We need the capability to do this right now. Uh, and ABMS and the team uh, was real boon to them and excitement to be able to take something for a, a tentative war fight to be able to actually apply it to save, you know, lives uh, mm -hmm. really and move doctors and medical support around to be able to predictively through artificial intelligence, get the right people at the right place at the right time. Yeah, and for the ABMS team watching, you, you personally helped me because the device one team that was, targeting having classified tablets and phones that could be used on the battlefield. If you're not aware of this, we, we fight on Android today. It's a very common um, platform for special operators and ground forces to use. Well, the device one team took that to the next level, bringing in zero trust technology so that we can access all sorts of classified data, but securely. And once COVID hit, 
weren't able to come into the Pentagon as easily. The device one team got me up and running at home on Cipernet, our secret level uh, communication network, uh, in a way that could have been a, a nightmare to do, uh, even, even months ago, where you'd have to lock up devices after you're done. And now you simply disconnect from the cloud and the device you're holding in your hand is just plain old ordinary unclassified. And yeah, that's great for me, you know, working at home, working remotely during COVID-19, but on the battlefield, knowing that a device left doesn't have critical information that the adversary can exploit, that's peace of mind for those users as well as commanders. So uh, portions of ABMS are real. We are moving at internet speed. But when someone says, what is ABMS? What is it? Show it to me. <laughs> It's a. It's not the Wizard of Oz hiding behind the curtain, right? It's not. It's not a mirage, but it's like asking someone to show you the internet. And I think the only way that you can truly understand the internet is to have that personal connection with it, where you see how life is fundamentally easier. And we're we've already had those experiences with Northcom, and hopefully very soon with Spacecom. And then what needs to be next are all the different other communities we need to reach. What about air combat command, global strike? What about ground forces? You know, uh, for our, the Army Fire Center of Excellence out in Oklahoma, when do we get them, their taste of that smart operation where data just shows up and it's exactly the data I needed? Who knew? Or, you know, Aegis ship commanders that are at the sea maneuvering an MCON and, oh my goodness, I needed to know that there's a threat over the horizon. Thank you, whoever's internet god, internet.mil gods, thank you. We need to have every community have that experience. That's our vision. But because you can't take a picture of the internet, it's very much your personal, your personal experience with it that forms your opinion. And until we get a, a few more on-ramps behind us, we're just not gonna have had enough of that personal experience to have a unified assessment of ABMS, but that's why we're working so fast, is we want people to say, huh, you know, I did get that information and I got it in a way that I could take action in a way I never could before. Very much like Waze, you know, on your, on your car driving home. Boy, all sorts of useful information pushed to you. You don't know where it's coming from. You trust it's right. And uh, often it's the difference between you getting a ticket or not. So uh, <laughs> the, that ticket uh, is quite costly on the battlefield. So we can't, even though Waze is in cute cartoons, right? Uh, we need to treat this like a serious business. It could be life or death whether that information shows up on time or not. Um, so I, as, you're, uh, as you're talking about that, you referenced uh, major commands like Air Combat Command and Global Strike Command. Uh, a few sort of just sw switching to thinking about uh, uh, administrative uh, and sort of management approaches here. So you, you've talked about it being a non-traditional breaking cultures uh, around here. So how, how are you thinking of how ABMS or the, the concept of ABMS-like uh, programs or initiatives that you're going to oversee and start here relates to the, the traditional uh, find a requirement to get a program element, start a program send it with a managed com and a program executive office. What, is, what does the future look like? Is it different? Is it a mix? Oh, it's got to be different. So the answer, if you ask me, does something need to be different? Uh, the answer is yes. You don't even have to tell me the rest of it. We have to continually evolve and be faster. But at a macro level, the, the area the difference will appear will be horizontal requirements. So that, that are very different than the vertical ones we get. Vertical ones relate to platforms really well. I need, I need a satellite at this altitude of this mass with this divert, with this kind of sensor, with this kind of communication suite. Got it. Those are things I can measure. I can put those on contract and I can ensure they're delivered. But, but standards, APIs, uh, even design philosophy, like open architecture, how open is open enough? Well, it varies by program, but you know, having, having a design philosophy that conveys horizontally across programs, that's ultimately where we're going. And it, we're not gonna be able to make those as hard and fast. We'll have things like, like you know, standards and APIs that will say that thou shalt do things this way, but a lot is gonna be left up to interpretation. And I think the only way that you get interpretation right is this DevOps mentality. You're, I, you, you can't give me a 300, thousand page document that, that's going to give me all the different 
you know, uh, provisos that would go into my horizontal architecture level design. But if I work with you in an iterative cycle, the operator can guide what we do next and next and next. And then we, as the, the engineers and the technical architects, have to make sure all of those iterative slices of capability actually do stack up into capability that can grow into the macro mission level. So this DevOps, if you take one thing away, DevOps is not, it, DevOps is a process. It is lean, it's, it's agile methodologies applied to software, but we can apply them to anything. And this DevOps relationship between developers and operators, it's much, much bigger than software alone. And ABMS is gonna be a key program to demonstrate that. I think it'll be bigger than this program too. Uh, sub, sub question to that. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about how the program executive offices are contributing and partnering on the ABMS program? Sure, yeah, the, the programs within ABMS are spread out across numerous PEOs. So cloud and platform are under our PEO for C3I and N up at Hanscom Air Force Base in the Air Force. But the PEO for our data management system that right now is being run just for space operations, it's run by the Kobayashi Maroon team under the Space and Missile Center. So that's Space Force, but they've got the most advanced data management capabilities. That's in a completely different service though under the same department. Now, how are these things going to possibly work together? And that's back to shared interfaces and standards across them. All of these different programs understand that, that their end goal is to make what they provide available as a service. You know, as a service, lowercase a, a, capital S, that has been running around this building for forever. And very few things are available as a service, whereas in our personal lives, so many things are. So we finally have the, the technical chops and the belief and the, the mandate within our two services, Preston, to build capabilities that are as a service. Well, once you do that, I don't have to have them be in one and only one PEO as long as everyone understands how their development environment seamlessly connects to the deployment, the production, and ultimately the operational environment. It's why getting cloud rights really big. It's why containerized software is really big because we don't want to be really awesome developing things in our development environment. And then, oh, we got to go through six months of regression testing, moving to the edge because we're still using virtual machine-based code. So bottom line, folks, this matters, right? This is, you can't just throw Pentagon buzzwords at this. I hear things like Kubernetes and containerization and software-defined systems, service mesh. All of that is like a buzzword smoothie in the Pentagon that people, they, they kind of drink via PowerPoint and they feel healthier, digitally healthier because they got all of those buzzwords in. But this building, I, I really don't believe understands them. And, the, and the, the sad thing about not understanding them is you can get them really wrong. You can get the tech stack wrong where your code and development isn't going to see the edge for months. And that's losing. That's absolutely losing in a digital war. So for, for all of you, if you're, if you're a government person, if you're an operator or a developer or somewhere in between, you got to really keep researching, reading, stay up with current tech trends because this stuff's changing like wildfire and it affects everything we do. Whether you develop or operate, you got to understand the tech to be current and relevant. And I think uh, he's just extending a few of those those thoughts as well with, you know, write code once, deploy many times uh, through the process of platform one and the DevOps reference design is really powerful uh, and efficient across the, the service. Same thing you mentioned, software defined radios and digital apertures, right? Install once, upgrade over time uh, through software. These are powerful tools of agility. They are. It's just, if you look at our, if people have mentioned requirements a few times, you don't really get requirements for agility or adaptability. We get requirements for performance. It's a very rigid, static thing. It's a target, you know, you aim at it. When you hit it, you're done, you know, touchdown. But agility and adaptability are much more important in today's age than just rote performance. And so if you're thinking, how will competitions in ABMS eventually work when we're not just doing cloud and platform and data, but we're actually competing like drones and sensors and computer type equipment that might go on one platform or many platforms, these on-ramps provide a wonderful opportunity to have industry demonstrate agility. 
And so if you want to know how, how can we create an act strat where we force industry to demonstrate agility, we'll simply give you a performance requirement. So back to that performance requirement for, for on-ramp uh, number X, but then you don't know what your requirement is gonna be for X plus one. And you're gonna to have to be agile enough to leave an on-ramp, go back in development, come back and demonstrate. And if you can't do that in four months, then it changes our uh, opinion about how adaptable you can be. So if you're out in industry, adaptability, look for technologies that increase your adaptability and agility, and you will be taking your company in the right direction. I think it's one of the one of the powers, and it'll tie into a question here of the on-ramps and the speed and rapidity of the on-ramps. Uh, but also a question that I certainly get a lot is why can't you just specify the exact problem spaces or kill chains, military speak from since to shoot, and all the on-ramps for an upcoming, you know, you know, three, four, five into the future. And one of those I think speaks to your your issue. One of the real reasons is that we don't want to ensure that we can only duct tape systems together for a particular a set of events that most likely would never apply in the real world, but to have that agility and uncertainty baked in from the beginning, uh, which I think is important both from industry as well as the government side to ensure that we can fight an uncertainty and not only be able to fight <laughs> in certainty. Well, when the, when the adversaries give us their war plans, then we'll <laughs> go ahead and specify the on-ramps out and the out years. Uh, adaptability and agility is gonna scare the, the hell out of us. We love knowing what the objectives are. We love knowing what the measurement criteria are. Um, but the future war against the peer in a digital age where numerous technologies that have never been used on the battlefield will be unveiled all at once, it's uncertainty on top of uncertainty. So we've got to become comfortable with having operational constructs that have to deal with uncertainty and agility and adaptability is your way through them. The Air Force really does believe in this concept of the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. And if you're faster at that, uh, then you'll win on average. And all we're looking to do with ABMS is to take this concept of the OODA loop and transcend it from something that people do to something that machines do and then machines do working with people. And to be able to do that so quickly that we still have the most responsive kill chain or decision chain uh, in whatever case we're facing. To think that we can guess what that is ahead of time, I think just simply keeps us in this old think that the future threat is known, that we will use our intelligence to tell us what the 2025 threat or the 2030 threat is. We will study that threat to death. We will diagnose what can beat that threat. We will turn that into performance specifications, put them on contract, and then leave and go home and sleep better knowing that we have solved the future. The future is unknowable. The solution is not knowable. And therefore, if you, if you can't know the end state, you've got to be able to adapt to whatever pops up. And so I think this is going to be a major culture shift, Preston. I see it. I see it in our service. This kind of, well, can we just kind of go back to something that's a little more what we know? And the answer is no, we can't. We can't and we won't. Because the second we do that, we won't be investing in the right technology, the right operational concepts to deal with the unknown. And every day in a future conflict could be the unknown again and again. Well, there are a number of folks uh, on here that are asking questions that uh, they've got technology that they'd like to help. Uh, maybe it's not fully mature. So uh, can you speak a little bit about how both traditional and less traditional uh, to defense uh, vendors can, can uh, partake and help? Sure. Well, one, that's, I'm glad if you're, if you're watching and you're like, I can help, that's exactly why we want to do things like this, is so that uh, you can hear from us and we give an opportunity to hear from you. So there are going to be 70 different industry teams participating in this next on-ramp alone. And so what I would ask you to do, once we clear this on-ramp, is we'll do open calls for industry to be able to make solutions, whether you are a traditional defense type company with a big shiny platform that you want to fly or sail or roll along at one of our events and show us how awesome it is. Uh, we want you to be able to do that. If you're a company that's never worked with defense and you've got amazing whatever kind of capabilities, phaser guns, proton torpedoes, or the, you know, the equivalent of the HAL 9000, but one that doesn't go crazy, uh, we want to hear from you as well and have opportunities for you to bring your capabilities to bear. And we're very, very interested in what uh, uh, data analytics and machine learning uh, companies can do as well. We'll have Maven participating. 
on this next on ramp, as well as myriad other AI initiatives in the department, like the Joint AI Center. So if you have a data analytics capability, what a great opportunity to show us how it works, pulling in real data. These on-ramps are really meant to be a place for industry to show off as well, but I hope you won't just show off because if you're bringing us only things that work, then your OODA loop's too slow. <laughs> it is, right? These four-month cycles can provide amazing learning for you and your engineers. So don't fear failure, right? That, that cannot be this hollow phrase that we say in, in this building and not mean. Uh, only through rapidity and agility can we keep up against an opponent like China that's going to double our population, um, uh, they're probably quadruple our population, double our GDP at least, and have 15 times the STEM graduates by the end of this decade. So folks, we have a huge scale problem. Right? We have to be very reverent about the problem that we face. And if we can't match scale with scale, then we've got to match it with being the disruptor. That's why this agility theme is critically important. And hope whatever kind of organization that you work in, that you bring that shift from performance to adaptability culture shift uh, to bear. We, we need it everywhere. So with, uh, with the multiple pathways for vendors and, and contributors in the commercial space to be able to partner, we've got the uh, call one, which is the IDIQ. Uh, we've got uh, call two, which has the, the specific task proposals and then opportunities to do cooperative research and development. Uh, there are some questions here about uh, with all the, the vendors that are getting onboarded onto the IDIQ and the multiple pathways. Uh, how is the Air and Space Force taking through? Uh, is there going to be a, a lead systems integrator? What's the government's role versus all the commercial vendors? No, no, uh, we're, there's no way we can have a, a lead system integrator for this. And, and if we end up having to, then um, I, I think it'll have been a failure on the government's part. The thing that we are demonstrating with, with digital engineering and, and full digital enclaves is that uh, the tools themselves are your integrator. And so whether you use Cameo or other systems, there are amazing tools that can be brought to bear that simplify integration, that de-risk combining things, whether you're combining them on a factory floor or combining them operationally. So the vision that we have is very, it's radical, but it's one we've got to move to, which is one, we, the government, having this digital infrastructure, talked about a lot of it here about cloud and platform and, and data as a service, but on the development side, we also aspire to having uh, model-based system engineering as a service, making uh, GBSDs tools available enterprise-wide. And so you can imagine, okay, having all government programs working in common infrastructure would allow you to do some of the things you mentioned, write code once, share it everywhere, seamlessly integrate things that were developed in different program teams or in different PEOs. Then the radical idea is we want industry on the same tech stack with us. I know it's mind blowing, and I, I do I do want to thank a major prime that is already working in our digital tech stack today, and that was a big culture shift for them. But just just hear me out why this is a big deal. So when we are working on the same tech stack for development that ultimately is used in operations, though it's clearly digitally separated if not physically separated, amazing things are possible when that tech stack provides the authorities to operate, the certifications, the approvals. And what used to be done by government people taking months now happens automatically. You as a designer developer get your green check with a circle around it that tells you that what you just wrote or developed is ready to go operate the same day. I have had industry have that experience. I have stood by them and watched their development to go up into a government cloud get seven green check marks and was available to go into an operational system with no additional checks or scrutiny. That construct is amazing from a development standpoint. Imagine in future if industry is able to do IRAD, to do proposals, and to know already that you've met your interface standards, that you've met your design criteria. You basically have the government in a box. And it gives you all those things you would have normally gotten through a design review. You can simply walk in and say, yep, already had a PDR with this design. Just check it. The power is amazing, Preston. But the thing that's going to suck, and I really do mean suck, and I don't like to use that word, is that we've got to be good at IT. 
and we're not. My email does not work the way I would like it to. <laughs> but the government is going to have to value IT as dearly as any of its war fighting systems to achieve this mega dream. But I don't see any way around it, Preston, because um, we can't be like the internet in all respects. You know, looking for cat videos is one thing, dropping bombs is another. So we're gonna to have to put a lot of hard work into how safety and Seek Eagle and nuclear surety and all the other checks that we do. The only way I see to speed those up is to try to maximally automate them in a way we control and understand. The only way I can think of automating them is in a tech stack that we own. I think uh, too, too often that, that whatever as a service that you mentioned earlier can be whatever as a disservice uh, <laughs> and it's too easy for us to do that, right? But I, I, I appreciate the vision that you're leading us to, uh, which I think takes us back to that user at the end. Uh, and so we've got uh, one of the folks uh, watching is an army officer, an infantry officer, uh, and uh, would like to take AVMS down to the, that tactical edge and say, how, how does AVMS help that tactical operator across uh, the army? Uh, whoever's watching from the Army, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. By the way, I love the Army term convergence. I love it. From the first time I've heard it, it's exactly what we would like to be able to do from a, a technical point of view, is to allow all the different systems to, to merge and act as if they're one thing. So let, let's talk about how this could work on the ground as an infantry officer in the Army. So, you know, let's, let's talk about one, what you contribute. You know, you, the unit that you're in, uh, both you individually, the sensors, the platforms that you're operating, they are valuable data that does not get to the joint force machine to machine. Your eyes on target, the, the, the ability for you to detect a jammer or radar may be the difference in whether we vector a fighter or a bomber or task a satellite. And so thing one is making sure that whatever it is that you are holding or interfacing with, that that data is streaming off as long as the connectivity with it isn't jammed. But then let's talk about the bigger so what. What can the system provide you? So, so I've stood in major operations center, major intelligence centers that are national treasures where information from whole of government assets at all classification levels is streaming down and there's this glass cell in the center where all the different products that are being driven by people making phone calls, writing PowerPoint slides, it all gets synthesized, put in front of one person that is commanding and controlling all of this national level intelligence. And I've been there for real world events and it's an inspiring thing, but boy, is it not the way we want to operate. Now, now, that's at a super classified facility that, let's just face it, we're not going to be not going to be able to just pick up that facility and move it forward out into the battlefield, put it at the forward operating base. But imagine if in future we're able to pull all of that data to fuse it together into one picture, lower the classification via fusion because you don't need to know if it came from a very sensitive cyber source or whether it came from a satellite or a commercial imager. As long as you know it's got that green check with the circle around it that says it's been verified by the system, imagine having national level situational awareness intelligence, the type of information that goes to the situational, the situation room in the White House. Imagine having that being pushed to you as soon as it could go to the White House or combatant commander. That's what we envision. Is that hard? No. It's today's technology. Now, if we pushed all of that like one big fire hose open, that's not doing you a service either. And I'm confident that Army leadership would say, wait a second, I don't want all of that information going to all echelons. There's some tuning and filtering I need to do. Obviously, work to do on this. So what we imagine it will be is that the information that is right for your mission, that's right for you as a user, will be coming to you because we have your profile in global cloud as well as local cloud. That just simply means we understand your mission, we understand you as a user. The, the, the user could be a unit, could be all the way down to the individual soldier, but more likely beginning at a unit level. So that when we get information on a new threat that's popped up, a drone is flying close by, 
those analytics in the cloud say, ah, this data immediately matches well to that army platoon. I'm going to go ahead and push it to them. And then the magic will be if you can actually interact with those analytics and say, that's exactly what I needed. I need more on this. Uh, can you give me anything that's related to this? And now you're starting to train those analytics to be better and better uh, battlefield buddies with you or wingmen if they're in the Air Force case or fellow sailors if you're in the Navy. You won't want to go to war without your R2D2 equivalent. And the, the disservice I think we do is that data that could save lives, that could be the difference between mission success or failure, we've got it in the government. We've got it. But it's in an architecture that's meant for people to make phone calls and send emails to share it. And all we want to do is simply create the machine-machine exchanges, work with the services on the right conops to determine who gets the right information, when, where, and how, so that history would never be able to say we could have won the war, but there is no but in our future with ABMS. Uh, taking it back to, to leadership, uh, General Raymond is still the chief of space operations, uh, but uh, General Goldfinger, who's been a, a vocal uh, advocate of moving into this all-domain command and control, uh, has passed the reins to General Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say some words about General Brown's perspective uh, on the priority and the way ahead? Well, General Brown has hit the building uh, with, with a force, and he is, one, an amazing leader, but he is coming in directly from the Pacific. So as the PACAF commander, he's coming in from that PACOM watch, Indo-PACOM watch, uh, having a very capable adversary uh, that, that he has to watch every day. And he is bringing a focus in that we must change or we'll lose. And that's exactly what we need. And the pivot that we're making in ABMS, caring more about data than just the platforms that we have and the service today, that's exactly the kind of change that we're gonna need his leadership to continue championing. And if you want a prediction from me based on my interactions with him, his litmus test is gonna be, what do we need to be able to fight and win in a high-end fight against China and Russia? And if we need it, then we'll do everything we can to ensure we have it. And if we don't need it, then we've gotta get rid of it with, uh, with extreme prejudice because it's, it's taking away resources to do more winning things. So I, I think his, I think his, his urgency is exactly what we're going to need on this program to get us through um, the scale-up phase, right? We've had, a, we've had a good startup phase, right? We, we, had, we did a demonstration four months out of the gun, connected the F-22, the F-35. We used cloud. We had a combatant commander say they loved what we had and would use it that same day. And all of that done in four months. But that's kind of your, your startup phase. And now we're having people look at us and say, like, what is it? What is this stuff? Like, I don't understand it. Uh, when, when are you just going to build the airplane that does whatever it does or the satellite? What is this internet stuff? We're in the scale-up phase now where we've got to lay enough foundation so that it actually forms a road you can drive on. As I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the thing that will end the scale-up phase is when enough communities have had that personal experience where they can say, I was sailing on a ship, I was an MCOM, and then the system pushed me this data and it did, it's exactly what I needed. And I definitely had that experience with the Navy in my last job. I, I had a, a great project connecting the Navy with a lot of national intelligence sources. And there was, there was resistance at first. It's like, I, we don't understand this data, we don't know where it's coming from. But once it was demystified and they understood that there were the right credentialed people releasing data to them that they could trust it and that it provided opportunities that their ships and submarines could not provide themselves. It spread like wildfire and every ship's captain wanted to be the next, uh, the, the next uh, operator to do something that hadn't been done before. So I'm a big believer if you give operators opportunities they don't have, uh, very quickly, their demands outstrip your ability to provide as a producer. And that's exactly the way it should be. We should have demanding operators who expect us to get this right. Well, you brought up platforms. Uh, so uh, one of our, our viewers ha has a question. Is it, What is the, the role, if any, for uh, people in an airborne battle management uh, platform of the future? Uh, what does that look like? Uh, how do we maintain the capability currently provided by such platforms? 
Sure. I mean, it's a big, I, it's a big question. I'm not going to pull any punches on it. Uh, if we've got to take a, a big airplane with people on it into harm's way into a future fight, uh, we're going to have to explain why we couldn't do that mission a different way. And I'll be the first to tell you, we're not ready to pull people out of the fight. We're not ready to, to AI everything up. R2-D2 is great in the movies, but R2-D2 in the real world gets really confused when an adversary is trying to mess with the data they're ingesting to make decisions. So adversarial tactics um, are the death of current machine learning. It's not hardened against them. So we're gonna have to have people engaged. And I think the, the first thing we're gonna have to do is pull people back from that leading edge of warfare where things are so lethal and uncertain, especially early in a conflict. I see a huge potential to be able to automate that to have drones and unmanned systems take on that dangerous job. And one of the most important things they're gonna do is produce data that we can use to get smarter about what that contact point of war looks like. I think that those leading edge assets, whether they're in the air, on the sea or on the ground, will have to be quarterbacked by people that are in platforms that are, that are standing back and ready to make the calls. And so I think there will be roles to have people being on those platforms, you know, making calls and being critical elements in the kill chain. But what we have to do is change the construct where they're needed at that front position. And so what's the, so what of this is we're gonna have to get really good at this system of systems creation. We're gonna have to be good at doing teams of things and autonomy and swarming systems. The stuff that's always kind of said in a litany when we talk about the future, but we don't have a lot of it today. And if we don't do it, then what we're basically telling future warfighters is that we chose not to change the culture. We chose not to change the design philosophy. And we're basically saying the risk of our inability to change, we're simply going to put on the backs of operators in a future conflict. We owe them better. So the thing I would ask, if you're, if you're a defender of the legacy approaches, just ask yourself, is that really the way we should be in 2030 or even today? And then, you know, how might the role you're in change if instead of what you do today, you are connected with autonomous things and you as, as the human overseer have to take your experience, your wisdom, your instinct of when you're being fooled and use that to ensure that the remotely operated uh, teammates uh, do their jobs better. And that's a very different fight. And I think I'm just going to be real. I'm going to be exceptionally frank. We've all feared this. I haven't feared it. I've been trying to push for this for years, but the services have feared this. I think every service has feared that this particular thing, that manned unmanned teaming where there are unmanned systems would eventually push operators out of a job and change the services in an irrevocable way that was feared. And I don't see it that way at all. I think we're about to create the most incredibly complex era of warfare where there will be so many unmanned systems producing data and autonomy routines that are running locally at the edge that are interfacing with autonomy that's global, all of it being messed with by an adversary in a highly contested cyber fight. And humans are going to be overloaded with responsibility to try to make all of those R2-D2-esque systems perform as well as they can in an environment that will have never been seen before on Earth. Is it going to change the way we operate? Absolutely. But are there going to be like fewer places where operators play exceptionally impactful roles? I don't see it. Not until there is this wicked form of AI that walks in the door and says, hey, by the way, I made myself and I've actually been part of your team for years. I'm just here to tell you I'm a machine. All right, that technology is still in science fiction. It's not gonna hit us anytime soon. Yeah, I think just extending that too, we tend to think of command and control as a platform or a place, right? And breaking that apart from that physical platform. And so those functions can be performed uh, with this sort of platform agnostic network yeah. and applications and data where your tanker can be to do C2 functions, your logistics platforms can do C2. That individual out there on an agile base or the soldier that was asked for could also you know, pursue that type of missions. It just right. opens up a whole new world rather than the very limited you know, handful of places on
on the globe where we tend to do that as a, as a service. Um, uh, another question here uh, about uh, uh, how uh, Congress is supportive uh, of uh, ABMS and as you look towards uh, fiscal year 21 and beyond, uh, what are your challenges with Congress? Are they supportive? Uh, how are you getting them on board with the culture change? Uh, no, I, I would say I've, I've been pleased with Congress's response. They're, they're watchful, I would say watchful, but supportive. We definitely have to brief them because it, this isn't like any program in the department. And you, it's really difficult to make PowerPoint slides. I mean, we've got these things here. It, it, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it shows me pictures of clouds and data and analytics. And, um, but it's really hard it's really hard to understand this the same way you can in aircraft development or satellite development that you check by different integration milestones as opposed to this, which is really more about, about architecture milestones. So we have to do a lot of in-person briefing with members of Congress and staffers. And once they hear it, um, we generally get support. And the way to lead off is simply to say, look, you're, you know, if, they're, if you're not aware, um, we're still a, a dial-up, we're not even that good. We're, we may be a, we're still a telephone service in a smartphone world. And a lot of members of Congress are not aware of that. You know, they, they see the military as cutting edge and dominant, and we certainly are. No one's going to want to go to war with us today. And I mean, what other military can rival the things we do? But we haven't done well in this digital domain. And I found a lot of members and staffers are just simply not aware that when we go do operations, it's because of amazing men and women that have to do things the hard way. And so we start there and we explain why in fighting a nation like China, if, if, if we bring superior people and superior platforms and they bring systems that are exchanging data faster, that are making decisions faster, that that faster decision chain could end up beating the human advantage that we have always enjoyed, uh, that that wakes people up and makes them supportive. And I do fear it. I, I do not, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that I absolutely will sign my name in blood that that machine learning is going to uh, repl, you know, it's going to be the 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 thing that is kind of an in an end state in the next revolution in military affairs, but it has the potential to be. So we can't be conservative on it. We can't just hope that it doesn't happen. And I don't, I don't think of any technology offhand that had the ability to erode human advantage. And in this building, in the Pentagon, whenever we have to make a tough choice or things are roughly a parity, one of the things we typically say in meetings is the human advantage. We have amazing operators. We're doing real world operations. We train with our allies and partners. So we're, we have people that we work with every day today who will go fight the same way we do. We have that human and partnership advantage. AI could take it away. So we really do have to think about a different regime where if we're not prepared, that final bumper sticker, human advantage, may not be a bumper sticker anymore. It may be the first bullet in a presentation that begins with back in the days when we had human advantage. And so we really do need to be serious about this. And I fear that this kind of goes in that bucket of cool tech that Will is interested in driving and it's innovation and, you know, the, you know, wearing t-shirts and hoodies side of the Air Force and Space Force. And I, it couldn't be further from the truth. This is one of the most important things we do. And if we fail, if you watching, if you're part of our team, if we fail, you know what this building, right? You see the symbol behind. This is not a bastion of risk taking that we're sitting in right now. This is a five sided coffin of conservatism. It's a, a coffin for uh, innovation. It is a bastion of conservatism. Uh, if we fail, this won't be tried again for years. And who knows how far ahead our adversaries will be. We've got to get this right. We touched on uh, people uh, and wanted them to be be successful. So one, one of the question is, if this is the the digital age that we're in in now, uh, to what extent do we need to get our air and space operators up to speed on operating in the cloud and digital and code? Uh, and how do you see that playing out? That yeah, every every operator, whether you're an air space force, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, there's just a level of digital proficiency you've got to have to, to work in today's world. But one of the things that's been exceptionally cool about Space Force, and since the question was slanted that way, 
is that uh, Chief Raymond really wants Space Force to be the most digitally proficient service, that every space professional has an amazing level of digital IQ. So I think that's wonderful. And as a small service that's creating a new identity, I think laying in in digital proficiency as a foundational layer is a wonderful way to begin. So I'm doing everything I can to support Chief, Chief Raymond on the acquisition side to make sure that future programs are built digitally. And then if, if the operators who use them are, are digital geniuses, then I think great things will happen. <laughs> uh, a number of questions on uh, legacy platforms uh, here. So uh, in, in general, to synthesize several of them, it, it, the question is, uh, we're going to be having legacy platforms around for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, what direction are you giving to legacy platform uh, developers, PEOs, uh, and users, and how do they integrate then into the ABMS uh, system of systems? Sure. No, it's, look, we're not, we, we're not going to snap our fingers and turn into the, uh, the sci-fi force of the future. And boy, when you join the Air Force, the first thing that hits you if you're in the acquisition role, we have a lot of old stuff. And boy, we spend a lot of money keeping it modern or at least proficient. I don't know if you can claim modern, but, and that's something we've got to change. So you're absolutely right. We're, we're going to have to, to have legacy systems. The task that, that we have to our legacy platforms is what does the smart variant of your system look like? So the evolution from phone to smartphone, what's the, the analogous evolution as you go from being plane to smart plane, bomber to smart bomber, ship to smart ship, ground vehicle to smart ground vehicle. And we actually have a formal tasking from Air Combat Command to determine what does smart fighter look like? What does fighter one look like? Fighter one does sound really awesome. So boy, uh, if, we haven't, if we haven't taken that domain name, Preston, we need to go, we need to go register that <laughs> right a, now. Just give me a couple of seconds. Right, everyone, <laughs> let's pause the video here and let's run out. But yeah, I think that's actually a really good way to think about it. So, so fighter one or bomber one, what do those platforms look like in an internet of things dot mill age? And it's not too esoteric or obscure. You, we would want to get as much processing capability on board as we can, as much storage capability as we can. It would be great to have a, a local cloud node. So if we get disconnected from the big global cloud, that an operator would know, okay, I've got 10 minutes of relevant data in the fight I'm in. Tick tock, tick tock, you know, and, and, and just, just like you would on navigational accuracy, you've got a sense of your digital or analytic accuracy. Uh, and then finally, we would want uh, to, to change the radios and if possible apertures so that we had maximum software defined systems so that we could talk to as many things as possible. And, the smartness behind those radios that would simply move between different rave forms, different frequencies to try to reestablish connectivity whenever it's lost and continue sharing data to the maximum number of users who are available to receive it. I, I think that's what a smart platform is gonna feel like in increment one. And so if you're out there and you're a legacy platform manager or user, that's the thinking we need. What does the smart variant of your platform look like? And then once you've, once you've thought about what it actually needs to be, then think about how do I use it? You know, how is a, let's just use that fighter one example. How is fighter one used on the battlefield? Well, right now, today we're sending it in as kill chains, but kill chains by itself, it's got weapons, it's got sensors, go kill as many air targets or ground targets. And then you need to go land, reload, and get back into the fight. In the future, the, the sensors on that fighter may be much more important than any amount of weapons it could carry in. And so the future concept may be flying that fighter till it's nearly out of gas, tanking it back up, and sending it back in with maybe only one war reserve weapon that's there to help defend itself because that sensor is much more viable. Maybe that soldier who asked before and said, how is ABMS going to help me? Maybe that fighter needs to be there because the, the AESA radars and its penetration capabilities can provide you that target quality track you need to put, to put a missile or put a mortar or to put a projectile on that target. Artillery, I've learned, is just a, you know, it's just a, a bread and butter part of the Army. And, 
But, you know, even with precision guided rounds, right, you still need to know where to fire. Well, you know, who's, who's thinking about doing fighter sorties today to support artillery? That may be a winning kill chain in a future fight uh, in Europe. So that's, that's the kind of thinking we need to do. And then I would ask those Army artillery units, what, is, what does Artillery 1 look like? What does Attackums 1 look like? What does HIMARS 1 look like? What does Gimler's 1? Keep going. You know, all of these things can play a much more important role when they're connected together. So, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully once the first few platforms get over the goal line, that people look and say, huh, that's not as hard as I thought. I can do that too. Well, you mentioned uh, fighting over in Europe. We've talked about the services, uh, but as we look overseas and think about our allies and partners, which we tend to do operations with, uh, of course, on ramp two with Northcom also has NORAD and the Canadian uh, United States partnership. Uh, but then overseas, looking uh, to this upcoming fiscal year with partnerships and with other Pacific nations and Europe, uh, European Command and some NATO allies uh, there, how is ABMS fitting in with allies and partners? Yeah, no, it's very simple. We want to bring allies and partners in to the maximum extent as quickly as possible. This is all about getting data shared across a joint force and the next evolution is a combined force. And sharing data and a multilateral point of view when you only have bilateral relationships with many nations has been a nightmare that I have lived and many others in this building. And the great thing about, about digital technology is it really makes data sharing easy. So if you'll share your data with me and you'll let me share it with these other groups, but not these others, all I have to do is do encryption and key management right and do persona management right. So it should make working as a highly combined force so much easier. And we're really looking forward to bringing in uh, a whole wide array of allies and partners. So if you're watching and you're like, hey, I really wanna be part of this on-ramp, then, then drop us a line because uh, I think I think one of the things we've got to demonstrate is it's a lot easier to do things with allies and partners if we get our digital tech right. As, as we come back from uh, overseas here and we think about our uh, essentially board of directors in, in Congress, uh, a, a question here, if you, uh, you know, were sitting here talking with Congress, how would you uh, explain and articulate to them both the value uh, that we need it, but also the oversight role that they have given that this isn't the usual uh, approach that they that they take? Sure. Uh, I put myself in their shoes. I'm certainly thinking, okay, I, I know you're doing a lot, and you can come brief me on these four-month cycles, these four-month on-ramps, but how do I measure your progress? Especially if you're telling me in Congress that you want to have some mystery, especially with industry, about what you're doing every four months so that you force adaptability, you, you have that forced creativity. And I think an easy way that uh, that Congress can track this is service by service, just simply on one side of a chart, having all of the data sources, where is data created? And on the right hand side of that slide, where is data used? And just simply seeing what is connected today and what isn't. And then over those four month cycles, more and more of those connections should go green. And then what I expect that we would start showing, I think we could probably start doing this uh, even, um, even at the end of this year, is generally the connections we hope we're gonna put in place as a function of time, but then saying, but, but this, is, this is all based on us putting effort into best value. Because you know, if we're competing five different platforms and we know we can only afford to get three of them connected, do we want to both weigh the operational value, the warfighter saying, this is what I need, but, but what they need also has to be bounded by what can actually be done and letting those two things bound like what actually goes into the next tranche of on ramps. I think if we do that, that we can actually measure our progress and, and show that we actually are becoming a, a internet of things across the military and creating so many kill chains that it's impossible for an adversary to stop them all. Yeah, I think, uh, as, as you mentioned that, I was thinking back to the, the team doing data one in the cloud that you mentioned started in space domain awareness, but, but we've now expanded to a bunch of other domains and uh, starting from a handful of sensors even a year ago now to, to over you know, 60 new data sources coming in and streaming into that's available to all you have to do is know how to connect to that and pull from it as opposed to 
brokering individual data relationships with the sensors. It's, it's opening up a pretty powerful uh, toolbox for operators. Uh, a question here, um, you've, you've mentioned many challenges, but uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge uh, to transforming that digital architecture of the military? Oh, the biggest challenge, I'm at, well, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give your question the, the thought of, that it needs. I think the, I think the biggest challenge is going to be, two, there are two things. The first are going to be the first platforms that that raise their hand and say, "I can be aircraft one or ship one or ground vehicle one," and the the uncertainty with where that funding comes from. And I definitely see the the writing in the tea leaves that they could raise their hand and that instantly becomes a bill that's, that's kicked back to that platform and then no one else tries it. And so given all of the platform modernization costs, this is yet another one. So I do fear that the first mover, if penalized, will create fear in all other movers and this won't happen again. I think the other thing that's just really challenging is in the probably the biggest challenge uh, aside from that first mover reward is just how big of a culture shift this is in terms of program management. I already have this building we're sitting in asking us for a five-year baseline. I mean, does anyone think they, what the, did anyone think they know what technology is going to be available in their personal lives in 2025? Anyone believe that? Well, if you do, and you've had a good track record in the past, I want you to send me your stock picks because <laughs> you have a vision of the future that, uh, um, that, uh, that we don't have. Uh, it's crazy to think about traditional acquisition applied to something that can evolve as quickly and organically as the internet. And the more this Pentagon keeps saying, where's your, you know, give me your, your work breakdown structure, give me your baseline. I think we can give them something that is its equivalent but it's not going to be written in stone. And I think ultimately, are we okay writing things in pencil in this building or do we want that tablet of stone? And if the answer is tablet of stone, then we're gonna continue uh, communicating the way the Flintstones did. And uh, I, I don't want to have future warfighters still making phone calls or whatever Fred had to do. I'm sure it was something that looked like a phone, but was dinosaur based. And if you're if you're out there screaming at me, don't you know it's a dino? Whatever. I've forgotten. It's been a long time since I've seen it. But we're getting a bunch of questions on that now. All right. <laughs> yes. So, you know, put it in the put it in the post in the uh, comments, please. Uh, well, we come to the time we're going to wrap up. So if uh, you could just offer a few final comments, and then I will wrap us up. Uh, no, I look, I've appreciated the questions. That's what it's mainly about. This is a huge challenge. We can do it. I mean, we're going to we're going to wrap up this session. I'm going to do a few more meetings here in the Pentagon and then I'm going to go home and I'm going to be in the world of ABMS. I have advanced battle management for my personal life. I can do, I probably shouldn't, you know, I don't want people to know what kind of systems I have, but I can change so much in my home on my way there. I can connect with data that is for both entertainment, for communication, and that affects my finances and my future retirement. I can do all of that by the time I drive home. And yes, I'm only looking when I'm stopped at lights. But I, I say that just to upload for everyone. That's real, right? I can affect things in the real world, I can get predictions across myriad different platforms on something as simple as a phone locked outside my office. So shame on us if we can't do this. I refuse to believe it's impossible because I'm going to go home to it. So if it's not impossible, then the answer is looking us in the mirror about what's hard. This is a culture shift. This is a process shift. But when I look around that mirror to what our warfighters are gonna face and uh, the very likelihood of a machine to machine adversary that could make decisions faster. We've gotta have the urgency to change that process, change that culture, change the way we do business. 
And if we do, and if we can get this right early on, this has a chance to be a universal leavener, a, a tide that literally raises all boats in the joint force because everyone can be a part of the future advanced battle management system or whatever we call it, the convergence of all of these things through digital enablement. Every system, every user can be a part of that. So it's not innovation, it's imperative. And if you're part of the team on this or you are in future, please don't put this in the bucket of something that would be nice to do. Getting this right is part and parcel of getting ready for that high end contested fight. And I'm very pleased that we've gotten off to a good start, Preston, and want to give you a final shout out. Your leadership and creativity and vision on this have been absolutely necessary. I have, I have complete, I completely believe without you being here, I would have something that feels like the Flintstones version of it, uh, uh, you know, monolithic, archaic, cartoonish. Uh, but I think you are helping us get this right. And I just want to thank you for that and hope that we can continue to support you in making ABMS real. Yeah, thanks. Let's pass that thanks on to the large uh, team across all of the Space Force and Air Force, uh, both on the, the command side and the program executive office side that are uh, doing the work and the combatant commanders to make it real. So uh, thank you all for that work. Thank you, Dr. Roper, for taking the, this time to uh, share with all of us uh, your vision and answers to the questions. And most importantly, uh, we thank all of you uh, out in the in viewer land for your questions, uh, interest uh, and insights uh, as we go forward. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to conclude our Ask Me Anything, Anything session for the day. Thank you for joining us.